Welcome. Join us for a look ahead. We are studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the second quarter of 2012. And this quarter is entitled Witnessing and Evangelism. This is lesson number four entitled Evangelism and Witnessing as a Lifestyle. And before we begin, we'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we begin. Our kind and loving Father, it's a great privilege to read your word, to study the truths that are there, and to find ways that we can better serve you and understand you. May that be our experience today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Evangelism and witnessing <coughs> as a lifestyle. Do you think your lifestyle is a witness? A witness to what? How well are we doing at witnessing by our lifestyles? Well, it should be obvious. Well, let's just look at some obvious things. It should be obvious that, to every thinking Christian at least, that the second coming of Christ has been long delayed. The Apostle John, way back in the first century, probably around 95 AD, said, you know, friends, Christians, it is the last hour, 1 John uh, 2.18. So, a last hour? And now it's 2000, almost 2,000 years later? Long uh, hours. Long hours. Long hours indeed. Well, for those who are familiar with the writings of Ellen White, in 1868, she said that the second coming had already been long delayed. And that's volume two of the testimonies, page 194. It's also found in Evangelism, page 694 in the second paragraph. If it is true that the three main pillars of our faith, or the main, the main pillars of Christian growth, are Bible study, prayer, and witnessing, as has been repeatedly suggested by many people, what do we need to do? Are we being effective in all these areas? Do all these areas go along together and, and so that, uh, uh, they, that we just sort of move ahead together? Or is it possible that we're more defective in witnessing, more defective in prayer, more defective in Bible study. What do you think the problem is? If we actually lived Christ-like lives, how long do you think it would be before Jesus would come again? Gordon. We, we tend to criticize the Israelites, the ancient Israelites, mm -hmm. who spent 40 years in the wilderness. And how long has it been since Ellen White said this? 144 years. More. So, yeah. So we're 100 years long, over 100 years longer than the Israelites wandered in the wilderness. Yes. And now I would like to add some, a punchline to what you just said from the book Evangelism, page 696, the second paragraph. This is from Manuscript 4, written 1883. For 40 years did unbelief murmuring and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel. Remember, this is 1883. It's 39 years after 1844. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. In neither case were the promises of God at fault. It is the unbelief, the worldliness, unconsecration, and strife among God, the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. Is it the problem of the people out there in the world? Who's at fault here? Well, the Lord's professed people. How many of us does that include? A little book called Christian Service. God demands that every soul who knows the truth shall seek to win others to the love of the truth. If we're not willing to make special sacrifices in order to save souls that are ready to perish, how can we be counted worthy to enter into the city of God? Page? Uh, like page 8.1. Eight, eight, mm -hmm. Well, we're preaching something. Our lives are saying something to the people around us. What are they saying? What gospel does our lives teach? Well, if I were to 
take the words out of the paragraph that you read, our lives are saying unbelief, worldliness, and unconsecration and strife. Wow. That doesn't sound like good news no. to me. No, it's not. Well, the truth is, I mean, if we, let's be really honest here. We're all a bunch of sinners. And the good news, the ultimate good, good news is never about us. At least not until we get into the kingdom of God, into heaven. The good news is about God. So what does your life and my life every day among the friends we associate with, what does that life say about God? Do our friends and neighbors looking at us and our day-by-day -day activities, do they suspect that we're Christians? Or is our behavior so close to the behavior of the people of the world around us that it really isn't very obvious whether we're different? How long should it take them to find that out? Shouldn't take very long. I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the Amish mm -hmm. that are Christians. Mm -hmm. They're very different. Mm -hmm. They're not shaking the world. No. So, what but, are but, they doing wrong? Hold on, hold on. Yeah, okay. But the question is, you don't shake the world by being different. Well, it sounded like it because you just you shake, said you you shake the said world. We're not no. being different. We're being like everybody else. Okay. You shake the world by being like God. Okay, so then that's like the God. difference. Now. Now, the, the next question is, how do you know that you're being like God? Okay, I'm going to read you a couple of texts because, I, you know, let me not just give you my opinion. Let's look at Scripture, okay? John 13, verse 35. Jesus was talking to the disciples on the last night. In fact, they're, they're leaving, getting ready to leave the upper room headed for the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, I'm going to read verses 34 and 35, John 13. And now I give you a new commandment, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Now, the command to love was not new. Perhaps the commandment to love others as I have loved you could be considered new. But the punchline comes next. If you have love for one another, that's agape for those of you who know about the Greek words. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. Now, does that apply only to Peter, Andrew, James, and John, etc.? Or could that apply even to us? I have a question. When mm -hmm. um, he, Jesus says, if you have love for one another, does he mean if you have for love for one another in the church, people will be looking from the outside and say, gee, they love one another? Um, therefore they're Jesus' disciples? Or does he say when you love one another that you love people inside and outside the church? It sounds to me like he's talking about everybody. Well, the parable of the Good Samaritan would suggest the latter. Mm -hmm. The Good Samaritan responded to the needs of his, his enemy. Mm -hmm and uh, showed him kindness, showed him love, and took care of him. So it's, it's, it's not our friends that we need to take care of. It's those who despise us. Okay, the second verse is found in Acts chapter 4. Um, if you look at the first part of Acts chapter 4, Peter and John uh, performed a miracle at the gate of the temple. They were arrested, taken before the Sanhedrin, and Peter instead of, you know, cowering as he did when the woman pointed a finger at him at the, at the trial of Jesus, stood up boldly and began telling the, 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 the Sanhedrin, says, you are the ones that are responsible for killing the Messiah and so forth like that. And what was their response? Well, look at verse 13. The members of the council were amazed to see how bold Peter and John were and to learn that they were ordinary men of no education. I mean, these guys didn't stand up and spout off their PhDs. They realized then, the council, the Sanhedrin, realized then that they had been companions of Jesus. There was something different about them. And that's the, that's the question we're asking. Okay, so now you brought up love one another mm -hmm. and be bold. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm counting. What else are you going to say? Uh, love one another and be a companion of Jesus. 
Okay, yeah. that could be a fourth one. But yeah. to be bold too, because yeah. you you well, they walked out. And okay, so what? <laughs> well, the point is, let's. We're talking <laughs> about witnessing now. We're talking about witnessing now. Mm -hmm. So you may be the most best Christian in the world, and if you're sitting in your corner quietly and you're afraid to open your mouth, no one's going to figure it out. So the bold has to have something to do with it. You asked for one more. I'll provide it from the same book. God could have reached his object in saving sinners without our aid. But in order for us to develop a character like Christ, we must share in his work. In order to enter into his joy, the joy of seeing souls redeemed by his sacrifice, we must participate in his labors for their redemption. Again, the reference? Uh, that's Desire of Ages, 142. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what did you just say there? I said that, that you have to develop a character like Christ. And the only way that you can do that is by sharing in the work of Christ. Okay. John Donne, famous poet, many years ago said, No man is an island. So how we are influencing other people, so how are we influencing other people around us every day? Are we unconsciously in influencing them for the right? Or should we make conscious efforts to correctly represent our God and our church? Do we always do what is right because it is right? That's, that's what Ellen White says. We should do what is right because it is right. That means we do what is right when no one's watching? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Edgar A. Guest, another famous poet, said, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one should walk with me than merely tell the way. The eye is a better pupil, more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but example is always clear. And the best of all the preachers are the men who live their creeds, for to see a good put in action is what everybody needs. So? Gary? So there's another one. Put mm -hmm. things into actions. Good. Put good things into actions. Good things into actions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what was it that set the early disciples apart from those around them? You could identify, if you had been in, in Palestine in Christ's day, you could have identified the Pharisees by their dress. You could identify Roman soldiers by their dress. You could identify the peasants, the poor people, by their dress. You could identify fishermen, maybe by their smell, but also by their dress. So, what was it about the disciples? Now, remember, we had disciples who were, who were tax collectors. We had disciples who were former fishermen. We have disciples who were uh, patriots, or what we might call today zealots, or, or you know, whatever other world. You, they were trying to rid the world of... Romans, so they could repatriate their country for themselves. I mean, there's a wide variety of people among those disciples. Wasn't it mostly what the disciples said? They made such sense. They had, they had a message. Mm -hmm. Someone said, uh, nothing is so strong as an idea or a message whose time has come, and yeah. the time had come. Okay. Well, is it true... I mean, let's, let's think about this for a moment. Is it really true that only Christians are truly loving? That seems to be what is implied by Jesus' statement. Absolutely No, I not. don't think that's true. But I think Why did he those, those non-Christians who act lovingly are responding to the Holy Spirit. And given the chance, they would be Christians. Okay, maybe they're on their way. They're on their way. And or they have had bad Christian examples and refuse Christianity, but uh, adopt the teachings of Christianity even though they don't know. Like I had one gentleman who's asked me about the Bible say he uh, didn't want anything to do with Christianity, but he believes in the Ten Commandments and that you should love one another because if we lived that way, we wouldn't be in this fix. So he had a strong belief, and he didn't realize he had a strong belief in real Christianity, and the fluff of Christianity turned him completely off. 
Mm -hmm. It was so strange to hear him say that. That's, th that's also a message that was given by one of the world's lo uh, most prominent imams who has been working with some, some Adventists, and they have been working with, with him. And he put out a message that these Adventists are not Christians. They are the people of the book that we expected to come. And so they don't, uh, he, for the first time, he found a group of people that don't eat meat, or don't eat pork, and they don't drink, and they don't carouse, and they're faithful to their wives. To him, that was the lifestyle of, Chris, of Christians. So these people who, who don't do that, they're not Christians. They're people of the book. Well, Mahatma Gandhi had a, had a saying somewhat similar. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And he put that message out to all the imams in the Muslim world. Well, here's a, here's a question. Now, getting a little closer back to our lesson, although these things are very relevant. Do Christians need to act loving or do we need to be loving? Be loving. People can tell a fake a mile away or an inch away. Do we need to put on a loving face? Or would it be true that if we act loving long enough, we would become loving? I think that's, that's part of it. You know, sometimes you can just tell. I, I think a lot of the, what I call the sweet little old ladies of the world, that you look at them and you can just see kindness just bubbling out of them like a, a fountain. And it is so precious to see those people that you mm -hmm. look at them and they just look kind. Mm -hmm. And to me, we're, we're, the world is getting away from these kind looks that I remember in the past. Mm -hmm. But how, how does God want us to show our, our love to people not of our faith? Now that's what we're talking about here, right? How are we going to reach out to the world? You know, it's, it's nice if we can love each other, but we're talking about witnessing now. We're talking about evangelism. So how does God want us to show love to the, the bum on the corner with his sign, give me a dollar, I need a beer? I'm a little confused. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Again. Uh. Um, we're, we're talking about showing love. We can't act love. We've got to have the real thing. I, it kind of reminds me of my grandmother once when I was in the academy. She pointed out this girl, now this such and such, she's, she's a really nice girl. How come you don't like her? Mm -hmm. And, um, well, it would be nice if I said, well, my grandmother th says this is a nice girl, so maybe I ought to love her. Mm -hmm. um, isn't that a little bit about what we're talking about here? No. I mean, I mean, what is the difference between acting love or doing love because of principle? There was a, a psychologist who had a whole group of people from the back wards of a mental institution, schizophrenics, and uh, they wanted to be accepted in society. So he took them and said, you want to be it? I'll show you how to be. And he said, I want you to, to be, to act like the person you want to be. And he started out very simply. These people were afraid to talk to anybody. And so he'd just say, now next time you meet somebody, I want you to call them by name. Just say hello, use their name. And he worked with them for uh, a year or so. And the vast majority of them left the back wards. They could be integrated into society. And it started by acting like you'd want to be. Which is kind of a definition of a lot of people in the church that we call legalists. Well, see how, see how it would fit with this definition from St. Paul, if I could dare call him that. Second Corinthians 3, verse 2. Two and three. You yourselves, Paul's talking to the Corinthians now. Now this is after he's had all those incredible experiences. Now this is his last letter to them. Remember he actually wrote four letters to the Corinthians. This is number four. You yourselves are the letter we have written on our hearts for everyone to know and read. It is clear that Christ himself wrote this letter and sent it by us. It is written not with ink but with the Spirit of the living God and not on stone tablets, but on human hearts. 
Now, would that be a description of something like what we need to be? You know, I don't know if that acting like you love someone even though you don't would work. I don't know. It just feels not integrated. I think we have to constantly ask God to put love in our hearts for the people we don't like. Sure. And uh, but I don't know if I can muster it up to, uh, you know. Well, it's interesting <laughs> in light of that. Let me tell you the other side of that coin. I have a friend who took a group of elderly people, citizens, in a, in a, in a retirement community and he helped them read through the whole Bible, book by book, talking about what it says about God. And when he got the last night, he said there will be a little time for people to stand up and make comments. And one very elderly lady stood up and she said, you know, so all my life I've been taught that I need to love God. And she says, I believe that I love God. But she says, now, having read the Bible through like this, I like him. <laughs> You know, Ken, when you're reading the Bible, there are general principles to live by. Mm -hmm. Love one another is one of those principles. And when you are living your life by the principles as they're presented in the Bible, and you come across somebody who is just irritating the living daylights out of you, mm -hmm. You, whatever your normal inclination is to get out of there, say what it is you would like to say, express yourself liberally, you, <coughs> you don't because it would be unkind. Mm -hmm. Probably what would come out my mouth would not be nice. And so you simply don't. You behave like the principle teaches you to be kind, to be generous, to be polite. Even though you don't feel like being that way, it doesn't matter. You still do it anyway. Yeah. That's part of the act. It. You know, when, when Peter was in the jail cell and it, the earthquake came and the doors opened, don't you think he wanted to run and get out of there? No. But that's not what he did. Principal mm -hmm. said, you know, if I run, the jailer is going to be killed. I think you're talking about Paul, but Thank I agree you. with you. Thank you, Paul. I, I don't know. It, it, it just well, seems, you know, you started out by saying that the Lord could have come a long time ago. And then we kind of point fingers at ourselves, mm -hmm. type of thing. But there's a, there's a missing ingredient that can only come to, from God to make all this stuff that you've listed off happen. Okay. I'm going to talk about and, that right now. And if that only comes at a certain rate... Mm -hmm at a certain time where we didn't even talk about the latter rain which which was what happened when when all these people started doing these fantastic things so it looks like the missing ingredient is outside of our control so let me understand what, what you just said that something that has to come from God is the missing ingredient so we're still here it's God's fault it's we're still here, probably for a reason. I think, well, I think it's true, you know, we could have come a long time ago, but the Lord no, can look through etern eternity and find out what questions need to be answered for that eternity mm -hmm. and know whether or not it has been answered sufficiently with the time that the earth has been. Like what, if his a, what if his answer was, I need more dedication from you? More dedication? Yeah. From each one of us. Well, did he say that? I'm postulating that that's my, that might be what he would say. Okay, then you've got to come up with proof that to make it right. Well, let me, let me put, put it this way. There's, there's a couple, two or three things that we still haven't put into the thing here. Ellen White said once, and I'm sorry I don't have time to look it up right now so I can read you the exact words, but she said, smile parents, smile teachers, even though your hearts are sad. Let not 
that too. And, why, and she goes on to explain why. She says, is it true that God loves you? Is it true that God wants you to be saved? Is that the real reality or is that pretend reality? That is the real reality. So the trouble you're going through right now is not the real reality. The real reality is that you are children of God. You need to live according to the real reality. So, uh, I mean, I, I, I take that very seriously. You know, children, even at a very young age, learn to identify phoniness. They can see it in their parents, even, pretty young. And as we get older, we get much more sophisticated at that. Picking, you know, we see, hmm, we watch even people on TV as little as we know about them. He's a phony, she's a phony, you know. We, we can pick it out very, queer, very quickly. So, I come back to my basic question. How are we affected by observing people whose actions do not match their claims? We, we've been talking about what happens if our actions don't match our claims. What about looking at other people? How are we affected by people whose actions don't match their claims? We blow them off. We're revolted. Well, it's okay. So how are we affected by those whose actions and claims clearly do match? Totally We're drawn impressed to and in amazement and wonder mm -hmm. because that is so unusual in today's world. Okay. So I'm going to go this next step. Then how does the presence of even one or two openly hypocritical Christians affect the picture secular people have of the entire church? Mm -hmm. Very much so. Well, God wanted the Israelites to get rid of those Canaanites because they would spoil the whole thing. One rotten, a one rotten apple can spoil the whole barrel. Yep. And I think we're just seeing it expressed again and again today. Well, the only thing that the Lord wanted them going <clears throat> and massacre them all. We can't massacre all the people around us. <clears throat> well, well what's no. What's happening, uh, we, could, we could list several churches who have faced difficulties in that hypocritical behavior. And, uh, but one church that's facing huge difficulties now, which my non-church friends are talking about, is the Crystal Cathedral. Mm -hmm. the, what is going on in that church is not a testimony yeah. to Christianity. It's, it's uh, causing... It's been sold, hasn't it? Yeah. But they are going through um, legal battles and, mm -hmm. and um, yep. name calling and. Okay, uh, well, we, are you holding them up higher than anybody else? I mean, as far as no, no. bad outcomes or. Well, they're pretty. Say? I don't know what to say. Oh, you don't know. I what don't to know say. what to say. Okay, oh, study their doctrine and you'll figure it out. They're not only <laughs> economically well, bankrupt, their <laughs> doctrine is... I'm bankrupt. glad that your doctrine is so perfect. <laughs> no, their doctrine at the base core level is really not that bad. Mm -hmm. uh, it's They've gotten a long ways from their base core doctrine. But I know people who are in other churches that have the base doctrine that they are, and s several of them are better Christians than me, even though... They believe in a burning hell and that. So, you know, um, uh, they are doing their, their denomination. Do you think we should have a man-centered religion instead of a God-centered religion? No. They do. That pastor did. Maybe no, that I, I wouldn't make that judgment myself, but... Uh, Just read it okay. out of his own book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let, uh, we, we've got a lot of other things to talk about, so let's... let's <laughs> Let, let's let's but try to put to the world. Yeah, let's try to put some pieces together here. To whom should we witness? You know, there's a lot of people every day. People who just pass us on the street is their way to witness to them. People we stand in line with at the bank or at the post office or whatever is their way to witness to those people. They're the people we 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 say sit in the table next to them at the restaurant is their way to witness to those people. The people we work with is a way to witness to them. Now, I'm going to tell a personal story. In fact, a couple of personal stories here, um, not to hold myself up as any kind of an example. I was traveling with my family some distance away from Loma Linda, and we were in an IHOP restaurant, and we were ready to have our meal. The meal had just been brought to us, 
and we always hold hands and pray. And so we're, we did, and we were busy eating our meal, and two young people, young people, from clear across the restaurant, came over us and said, thank you for that witness. You know, I, have, I have, don't know their names, I have no idea how it might have impacted them or anybody else in the restaurant, but they did. Another interesting case happened, we were recently in a large restaurant, very busy restaurant, feeds hundreds, even thousands of people every day. And again, the same story, we had our meal served to us, and we were just you know, ready to eat, we held hands, and we prayed. And just as we finished praying, the, the waiter had walked up to us, and he looked at us and he said, and this was a restaurant that was known for hiring people from all over the world just to make a nice, interesting mix. This guy, this guy came from Belarus. So you know, non-Christian, completely communistic background and so forth. He said, you know, he said, that was very interesting. He says, I have worked in this restaurant for years thousands of people every day that I see. He says, and I've seen people pray in movies. I've seen people pray, you know, I've read about it in books and so forth, but this is the first time I've ever seen anybody actually doing it. Now, let me tell you, I can guarantee you there were hundreds of other Christians in that restaurant the very moment we were there. Now, again, I'm not trying to hold myself up, but it's just to suggest that there are ways we might impact people by simple things that we do. Now, maybe there's other people who went home and said, look at those foolish people over the praying. I don't, I don't know. Maybe that happened, too. Well, you were kind of doing things out of the ordinary. But very quietly. We didn't make any big show. Yeah. But I, guess, I think my point is that if it was more common, say that... that mm -hmm. Five people out of eight did that, mm -hmm. you know, they wouldn't think nothing of it. Yeah. Well, That's isn't that so. horrible that it isn't more common? I mean, we should be ashamed of ourselves. Well, there's a lot of things that are common, like we don't get mad and just shoot people in the, anymore, like they did in the Wild West. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that are, that are pretty good, <laughs> we're, we're well mm -hmm. off on, you know, but we, we're, we're used to it. We're used to it, so. Some people take the wear their religion kind of, you see on their sleeve, they say, oh, I'm so-and-so, I'm this mm -hmm. way. But then they try to cheat people out of, out of uh, economic, uh, mm -hmm. what, what's really the due of the other person, which really misrepresents God. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Jane Ann. I think we, we witness when we're not aware of it. And I was caught up very short one time. Um, I had two little kids, one in the grocery cart seat and one in the basket. I think they were about that small. And we were in Stater Brothers in Loma Linda. And we were doing our shopping, and we were there every week, or maybe twice a week, the same parade. And we were doing our shopping, and so on and so on. And finally, after a number of months, um, the man behind the meat counter uh, said, by the way, are you a Seventh-day Adventist? And I, and I said, well, yes, I said, I am. And he said, I thought so. I can tell by the way you handle your children that you're mm. a Seventh-day Adventist. I had no idea anybody was paying any attention. I thought he was going to say, I could tell because you never bought any meat from me. <laughs> <laughs> no, he could not say that at that time. <laughs> but, but, but I was just taken back, and all of a sudden I thought, People are watching when we're not expecting it. Uh -huh. And there's a genuineness to it that, that is so necessary yeah. and so, so developable by the Holy Spirit. But it has to come from there. Okay, now, we're talking about witnessing. We're talking about ways we can reach people around us. So I want us to, I'm going to nail us back to this topic. Here's Jesus' example. This is Matthew 9, starting with verse 36. As he saw the crowds, his heart was filled with pity for them because they were worried and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So he said to his disciples, what do you think he said? Feed them. What do you suppose he would say? How much food do we got? 
The harvest is large, but there are few workers to gather it in. Pray to the owner of the harvest that he will send out workers to gather in his harvest. What did he mean by that? Let me give you another verse that's sort of parallel. Luke 10, verse 2. He said to them, There is a large harvest, but few workers to gather it in. Pray to the owner of the harvest that he will send out workers to gather in his harvest. That means that uh, God has a lot of spare workers sitting around somewhere. If we would just pray for them, God would just bring them out and they'd go to work and the work would be finished. Maybe we're the workers that we're supposed to be praying for. Right? Hmm. We ourselves. I have this uh, book that is very popular. It's called Radiant Living. Mm -hmm. It's, it's an, an Adventist book, and it, it has health principles in it. And I'll just leave that places like at the post office, and I don't live anywhere near Adventist church. And it's amazing. As I sit in my car, one or two people come out, and I'll notice that they'll have that magazine. It'll go that fast. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I think what the Adventists have to offer is a lot of religions, they leave you at the spiritual level, and, and you feel kind of like there's no connection with your life. You leave after church, and the Adventists bring the spiritual level into the living level and give you principles. Well, Christians do this, and they drink water, they get sleep, so their, their body's a temple of God, and all this stuff. And it's totally fascinating mm -hmm. to people that Christianity can be brought into a life, into a person, yes. because it's not done really that often. Let, let, let me parallel your story with an interesting one. We lived for four years in, in Kenya, in East Africa. We lived 17 years altogether in Africa, but four of those years we lived in Nairobi, Kenya. And we heard that there were some people coming through on their way home, missionaries coming through on their way home, and would we be willing to help them out or maybe keep them for overnight or some while they're waiting for their plane. So we, brought, we took in this family and found out that they weren't typical missionaries. This man actually worked for the U.S. Embassy in Mogadishu, Somalia. And this was back in the days when Somalia was a real hotbed. Not that it isn't still a hotbed, but mm -hmm. these were in the early days when it was a really hotbed. And you, you know, strict, it was a very, you know, Sharia law, very strict Muslim country. You know, and you're not allowed to evangelize for Christianity at all. But these guys were working for the, this family was working for the U.S. Embassy because the father was a, one of these diesel mechanics for these huge, big, earth-moving machines and that kind of stuff. So he, that's how he, he, what he was doing in, in, in his job. So they ordered all the Adventist magazines they thought they could get away with. And they would look at them briefly. And then they would, take the, they would put the trash out two or three days in advance in the street and they would put these nice, colorful Adventist magazines on the top of the trash. <laughs> and none of them ever got it. <laughs> about about uh, maybe 17, 18 years ago, I had a, a couple in the office, and they, told, they were from Guatemala, and they told me how somebody had taken a whole load of Ellen White's books into the dump. Mm -hmm. Somebody had gathered them up, took them back to their people, and these people, at the time I met them, they were living over at La Sierra, were Adventists, and quite, quite a few people were Become became Adventists Adventist because of Ellen White's books being taken to the dump. That's <laughs> <laughs> a bizarre story. But well, I mean, here's some examples. Now, how, how do we live that kind of life? I mean, wh where are the people in our lives? People are, are watching us, listening to us now. What can we do? What practical suggestions can we give to touch people's lives? Well, one thing we can do, I don't think we do, is in ch in for our churches, do we ever have visitors sign in and we send them a thank you for attending our church? Yeah, we do that sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it's done on a real regular basis. But I've never seen it yeah. in 14 years. So. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. But I went to another church and they had me sign in and I received a mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, I, I, we have received uh, thank you notes from several different Adventist churches. Did it make you feel good? Yeah. Okay, well, let's talk about some of the ways in which we might witness. One of the things that Jesus did was a lot of healing. We have a health message. We have hospitals. We have clinics. We have schools. 
Are there ways that we can witness through those things? We can I mean, put a piece of literature in them. Well, okay, but now hold on. You're sure a paper person. <laughs> That's fine. That's, That's okay. how I became an Adventist, is okay. I read the yeah. literature in the waiting rooms. Yeah, good. Uh, and, um, I can see that. Yeah. We, uh, let's, let's, th let's think about it. That's how she became baptized. So, okay, Christians have sometimes taught that every person has a need for God. I, I believe that. They, they may not recognize their need for God, but they recognize that there's an emptiness. There's some kind of a something. And they may not, they may, if you ask them, they would say, oh, no, no, I don't need God. But they feel some kind of a need. If we really look happy and we're, as we go about our daily activities and we seem to be fulfilled, people look at us and say, what is it about you? Are they looking to see Jesus? Are they looking at us to see Jesus? But it's our responsibility to become happy and fulfilled by following God's laws, mm -hmm. because then we do become happier and fulfilled. Because you can't act happy and fulfilled if you aren't happy and fulfilled. Yeah. Ken, how do we um, do all of these good things? And when people see us, just behaving ourselves, living by the principles of the Bible, how do we point them back to God? Well, I, I was them coming to, to that. God. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, I mean, I, I already posed that question. I mean, with the people we stand in line with at the post office or at the doctor's office or at the, you know, the bank or the whatever. Uh, how do we witness to those people? You know, I'm not sure that they realize that what they see at us comes from God. They just mm -hmm. think we're lucky. Mm -hmm. It could be. I think we should be very open about our conversation and uh, mentioned, uh, oh, when I went to church last week or, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and drop the word church, God, Jesus, or somehow uh, not be afraid to say those words. Well, there's an old Indian proverb that says we shouldn't criticize anybody or advise them about what they should do until we walked in their moccasins for two weeks. Mm -hmm. That suggests that we really need to, to, to focus on felt needs. I mean, obviously, the people who are sick, they have, they have a clear felt need. Okay. Is that where we, one a place where we can reach out to people? This conversation reminds me of a story that, mm -hmm. uh, that I read or heard about uh, three businessmen who were on their way home Chicago, they were in the O'Hare International Airport and they were uh, in a time crunch to make their plane and they're running to to catch, uh, uh, make their gate and they come around the corner and run into uh, a blind lady who's who's got a shopping cart and uh, apples and all sorts of stuff and uh, uh, well they're in a hurry so they, they went on to the gate. And the man telling the story said, I'll wait. He said, I'll go back. He said, I'll miss my plane. And he goes back, finds the lady, and helps her mm -hmm. pick her stuff up. And she turns to him and says, are you Jesus? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Here's another example. You know, it's best to tell true examples, and so maybe they'll give us some ideas. 1 Corinthians 9, starting with verse 20. This is Paul speaking, obviously. While working with the Jews, I live like a Jew in order to win them, and even though I myself am not subject to the law of Moses the way they thought he should be, I add, I live as though I were wor when working with those who are in order to win them. In the same way, when working with Gentiles, I live like a Gentile outside the Jewish law in order to win Gentiles. This does not mean that I don't, don't obey God's law. I am really under Christ's law. Among the weak in faith, I become weak like one of them in order to win them. So I become all things to all people. And a lot of people want to stop reading right there, but that's not what it says. I become all things to all people that I may save some of them by whatever means are possible. Is that one of the problems, that uh, we're not willing to uh, reach out and try to understand people where they are and their issues and their problems? 
maybe some of us are not willing to step outside the Adventist circle of friends we have mm -hmm. to become friends with another person. Let me take Paul's example, a couple of Paul's examples again. Look at Galatians 2.11 and following. And this is Paul speaking again. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him in public because he was clearly wrong. Now, Peter's obviously one of the pillars of the church, right? But before some men who had been sent by James, another pillar of the church, arrived there, Peter had been eating with the Gentile brothers and sisters. But after these men arrived, he drew back and would not eat with the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who were in favor of circumcising them. The other Jewish brothers and sisters also started acting like cowards, along with Peter. And even Barnabas was swept along by their cowardly action. When I saw that they were not walking a straight path in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you have been living like a Gentile, not like a Jew. How then can you try to force Gentiles to live like Jews? Spoken, spoken like a true Pharisee, right? Paul used to be a Pharisee of the Pharisees, right? Was that a case of living like a Jew among Jews and like a Gentile among Gentiles? Well, there's another example, which I don't have time to read. I wish I did. Now, why, why did you ask that? Well, I'm asking you, I, I want to ask, and the question here okay, is, so Paul says, I live like a Jew when I'm among Jews. I live like a Gentile among my Gentiles. So is that one of the ways we could be better witnesses? Well, what did that have to do with, um, with Peter and Peter? falling back, you know, just because... Well, okay, in. shall I take them? Uh, I didn't, thought maybe I'd let you decide that for yourself. Do we Adventists, when we're with a group of people, we gather in a little huddle of Adventists, we say, you, you people stand back over there, we're Adventists, we're not, we're not going to mix with you. I think it's done for two reasons. Number one, that, um, <clears throat> uppityness. And number two, there's a lack of confidence in a lot of Adventists, and they really don't think they're that good, when really, if they would count their blessings or whatever and, and see that they really have a lot to offer. So it's either extreme, I call it uppityness or clickiness, or I think there's a lot of non-confident people, and that is really insulting God, because you're a child of God, and you should be able to talk about him even though you don't feel perfect yourself. Just after Paul wrote Galatians and Romans, he, g he gathered with a group of friends carrying a large offering to take back to Jerusalem. They had to walk a long ways around, up around through <coughs> Macedonia and so forth. They finally got over to somewhere around Miletus, somewhere around, I think, maybe Troas. They got a boat and eventually they got to Jerusalem. They poured out their offering in front of the General Conference brethren, I mean, the, 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 the the, the brethren of those days, and they were, those brethren were temporarily warmed. You can read about this story in Acts the Apostles, the book by Ellen White, starting about page 397 up to page 405. But if you read through there, it says that Paul finally said, among these Jews, maybe I really need to act like a Jew. They said, you know, we know, Paul, that you've been out there preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles are loving it, and they're flocking into the church, and the people back here have real questions about you. Maybe you're not really a Jew anymore. And Paul compromised with the General Conference brethren at that point in time, and what was the result? Early he got himself arrested and put in prison. So why now, would, why would that get him arrested? Well, because he was in the t what happened was he was in the temple with some people who had taken this vow, and he'd gone through all the way to the last day. He was just finishing this thing, and some Jews who had been opposing him out in the field saw him in there and thought that he had brought Gentiles into the temple. That was their accusation. They had, it wasn't true. They couldn't prove it, but just the very accusation was enough for him to be thrown into prison. And he spent the next four years in prison instead of out witnessing. You know, we, we've talked a lot about strategy for mm -hmm. witnessing. It's, there's so much there, it's bewildering. Yeah. I'm just wondering if, if 
we're really going to get anywhere wading through all this stuff. Isn't there kind of a, can you just take it and condense it down into something small? Well, let's, let's and try And say it. that this will make everything else no, follow? We're not going to find five sentences that say, okay, this is exactly how everybody should do it. If you look at the example of Jesus when he was with the woman at the well, he spoke about water. When he was with fishermen, he spoke about nets and about fish and about weather. When he was with farmers, he spoke about sowing the seed and preparing the soil, etc., etc. He spoke to every person according to his situation, according to his needs, and he spoke about common, simple things that everybody knew about and they understood exactly. Even the small children understood when, you know, what he was talking about when he said the parable of the, the sower who went forth to sow. They all understood and immediately they recognized. We, but what if I can't do that? We need practice. Okay, so that's, that's the key right there. You've got to practice doing that specific thing? Well, we need to think about. See, here's the problem. Let, I'm going to get really basic now. The problem is we are so concerned about ourselves. Mm -hmm. We are so selfish. If I, please excuse me for, let, let me say, let me put myself there. I am so selfish, I tend to be naturally, as a human being, so inclined to follow the selfishness of the devil that I can't reach out and see other people's needs. I we need to learn how to look at other people to recognize their needs. And if we recognize their needs and reach out to them where their needs are, we will get a response. Okay, but you don't think that there's one little thing we can go to that all this stuff will follow? I think if what about if, if what about the Bible, learning of Jesus? I think if there were, the Bible would be a small pamphlet. Well, what about learning about Jesus? Yeah, sure. What about look just, at following his just example, coming down and praying? Show me, show me you. Mm -hmm. won't, won't that won't everything follow from there? Yeah, I, if he did that potentially, if you did that really I mean, honestly, you would, you would start valuing him, you'd start understanding him, you'd sure. start wanting to be like him. If we learn to love as he loved, getting, it will solve the problem. Getting um, into other people's lives to talk in their realm, I think is easier for females who have had to do that their lives to get their way. So it's like self-serving in a way. And well, I'm a male, so I'm in trouble. I, well, I think men have made it in the work world, and I, I don't know, they don't, you have, we have to get into our children's lives to try to make them obey and, and uh, into fluff up men to get them to do what we want, and you know. And <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. Uh, so <laughs> it's two sides of the same coin. One side, you, you hold out the goal of what should be done, and on the other side of the coin, you say, here's what we're not doing. And, and, and so it's, you, it's not always negative, it's, and you can't just depend on the positive, because you need to find out wh where things are missing. Let, let me take your simple approach. If you read Mark 5, 1 to 19, you will read the story about the demoniac man on the other side of the Lake Galilee. Yeah, hopefully you know the story. I don't have time to read it right now. But at the end of that story, something very interesting happens. Jesus says to that man, the man says, please, thank you for rescuing me. Can't I go with you? And Jesus says, no, you can't go with me. The man had been with Jesus maybe an hour or two or maybe three at the most. And what did Jesus tell him? Go tell them what's, what's go happened to tell you. Tell people what's happened to you. Go back home and tell the people your story. You don't have to, I, he didn't say go back and tell them, explain, to the go, explain the gospel to them. He says, go back and tell them your story. And when Jesus came back to that same place a few months later, thousands and thousands of people flocked out to hear what he said because of what that man had said about his three-hour encounter with Jesus. But none of that would have happened unless Jesus had walked by. Yeah, but... Are you saying Jesus hasn't done anything for you? Oh, he has, but... Well, um, so that's your story. Well, that's true, but there you go. still... I mean, we were talking about the missing ingredient a little mm -hmm. while ago. Mm -hmm. If Jesus doesn't walk by the first time, where are we? Sure, but I don't, think we, I don't think we're in a position to blame God. 
If you need help, the Holy Spirit will be right there. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just, yeah. I'm just um, well, trying the, to find out what's happening yeah, here. The really sad part about this, in light of that story, what that Gentile, the first, that man was actually the first Gentile missionary. The contrast is found in John 1, verse 11. And this is talking about Jesus. He came to his own country. And literally, it, it really is, he came to his own home. But his own people did not receive him. That is really, really sad. Okay. Well, <clears throat> and some very interesting studies have been done on Adventists. I probably should have gotten all the details here and quoted it so someone could look at it. But it, they found out that when people first become, if they become Adventists as adults, when they first become Adventists, they go around and telling the, tell their friends about what's happened to them and so forth. And they're, they're pretty good witnesses. But on the average, by the time you've been a Seventh-day Adventist for seven years, you have only Adventist friends. What does that say about our witnessing? That means you converted everybody, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's what it means. It's not true if you don't live near an Adventist church. Maybe that's why Ellen White wanted us to get out a bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to take one more example. Luke 14, 12. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a lunch or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors. Isn't that what Adventists do? For they will invite you back, and in this way you'll be paid for what you did. When you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they are not able to pay you back. God will repay you on the day the good people rise from death. How many Adventists, maybe and maybe not, including yourself, how many Adventists do you know that actually do that? When you invite someone to Thanksgiving or uh, some family gathering that normally doesn't have um, any place to go, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that would be a great example. Well, we're running out of time. Is our church more like a fortress where every once in a while we send out a, a well-guarded team out into the community to try to gather up a few people and bring them back? Or are we honestly reaching out in all of the ways, and I wish we could answer Gary's prayer and give it a real simple formula, but we need to be reaching out in lots of ways. Do it your way.